In this video, I'm going to present a second order optimization scheme for finding logistic regression models. And this scheme will be called Newton Refson optimization. And along the way of deriving this second order optimization scheme, I will show that the logistic regression problem, the logistic regression error function, is actually a convex function and hence it only has one globally optimal solution. Again, a quick recap. We have data pairs, input output pairs, where the output is a binary target. So we're considering two class classification and we are going to base our prediction via a, a probabilistic discriminative model. So really we try to predict the probability of my data point um, belonging to a particular class, to class one. And uh, the probability of my data point belonging to class one is given by this logistic sigmoid function. Now, in order to obtain my optimal model parameters W, I'm going to minimize the negative log likelihood. And the negative log likelihood is given in the following form. And this thing over here is often called the cross entropy error function. Okay, and this cross entropy error function is a convex function with respect to W, which means uh, that it only has one globally optimal solution. And we can find such a solution, for example, via stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and in this video, I'm going to present a second order optimization algorithm to find our globally optimal parameters W. And along the way, I will show that uh, this uh, function is indeed convex by inspecting its second order derivatives. Now the approach is as follows. So this newton Refson iterative optimization scheme is in a way similar to stochastic gradient descent, uh, mainly based on the fact that uh, we have this iterative scheme where we start off with an initial guess and then we update my model parameters W at each uh, step. And now we're essentially going to make a quadratic um, estimation of my error function, whereas previously uh, we used a gradient, which ex essentially gives us a, a linear approximation of my function. And with that, I mean the following. Suppose we have this uh, convex error function because my uh, cross entropy loss uh, was convex and I have an initial estimate for my uh, parameters W. So this is W time step uh, zero. What my gradient descent algorithm does, it uh, looks for the gradient. So let's say it points in this direction and then I'm going to walk downhill this gradient direction. So um, really what this gradient does, it gives us a local approximation of my function as a linear function. Uh, so it looks like this. I'm, the error, it basically says my error increases if I go in this direction and it decreases if I go in this direction. And of course we want to minimize the error so we move along the negative gradient direction. But we have to pick a step size, right? Because it keeps going down forever because it's a linear model. So um, <laughs> if I really want to minimize this linear approximation, I just go to infinity and I get my error, which is minus infinity, uh, which doesn't make sense, of course. So I have to pick a certain step size. So that's what we do. And every time we estimate the gradient, pick a step size, and then we walk downhill until we reach our uh, optimal value. Okay, so with stochastic gradient descent, so with stochastic gradient descent, I have to work with a particular step size, uh, eta. Now what we're going to do in this uh, second order approximation scheme, I have my, so these blue lines correspond to my uh, true error function. And now I'm going to approximate locally. So I'm considering um, my function around the weight uh, set uh, W naught. And I'm going to make a quadratic approximation of my error function around this data point. And maybe it looks something uh, like this. So I make this quadratic approximation, so E uh, tilde is a function of W, and it, it maybe looks something like this. And what I'm then going to say, my next uh, model parameters are going to be given by the minimizer of this approximation. So it's a quadratic approximation, so it has one global uh, minimum, and it lies, for example, at this particular point. So that will be my next model parameters at time step at tau plus one. Okay, so I'm going to repeat this. I again obtain this quadratic approximation and my approximation says that the 
global minimum of my approximation lies somewhere over here. So, okay, that gives me the next point and so on. And by doing this, by making this quadratic approximation, I actually take a curvature of my energy error landscape into account. I sort of know from local inspection that I have to steer a bit in this direction and make my step, start, uh, step in this corresponding direction. And that in the end leads to the fact that not only I reach my uh, global optimum of my error landscape in less steps, it also shows uh, that I do not have to select a particular step size. Because in my linear approximation, I really do have to set a step size, otherwise I keep on going forever in one particular direction. Uh, but in the quadratic approximation case, uh, my approximation says there is one minimal value of my approximative uh, error landscape. Let's just pick that value. So there's no reason to set or select a particular step size. Okay, now in this video, I'm going to explain how to obtain such a quadratic approximation, uh, which essentially is done by a Taylor expansion. Then I'll show how to minimize this uh, approximation and that gives me the next um, weight vector. And at some points, these points, they lie very close to each other because I've reached the global optimum. So basically I stop whenever my new iterate is very close to what I already had. Okay, so this gives me an algorithm for walking downhill this error landscape, uh, taking the curvature of my energy landscape into account. And in the end, I will converge to my globally optimal uh, value for W. Okay, so what does all of this look like? I said I'm going to approximate my error function W with a second order Taylor expansion around the weights that I'm currently considering. So I'm computing a second order Taylor expansion around W at time step uh, tau minus one. Now, what does such a Taylor expansion for multivariate functions looks like, uh, look like? So um, it's just a Taylor expansion as we've used to. So we take uh, the function value at the point that we're considering plus the first order derivative, which is now the gradient times a particular step size uh, relative to this uh, central point, plus my second order derivative, which is captured via this Hessian matrix times, well, my step size squared. And in the multivariate case, it means um, I multiply it on the left and right. So this Hessian is multiplied on the left and right of this uh, with this step size. Okay, so this is what the Taylor expansion uh, looks like. It's an approximation. It's a second order approximation of my error function W um, where I'm approximated in the following. So I center this approximation around my current uh, estimate for W and this is then a relative offset uh, parameter. And this Taylor expansion requires to compute first order derivatives, first order multivariate derivatives. So it requires us to compute the gradient, uh, which we've done already in the previous video but it also requires us to compute the second order derivatives, which are captured in this Hessian. And this Hessian is a matrix with rows I and columns J given by my second order derivatives of my error WI, WJ. And this Hessian matrix is symmetric it is symmetric because I can change the order here. Uh, the derivatives uh, in this uh, vector space commute basically. So I am, I am allowed to change this order and that tells me that the Hessian is symmetric. For now, let's just focus on the recipe. So um, now I want to make my update rule uh, using a optimal step in the right direction. And I'm going to pick the step delta w that minimizes my approximated uh, error function. So that means, so that's, that's what I've explained over here, right? I made an estimate of my error functions. Those are those green contours. And I take as next data points, the w that minimize this, uh, this approximate error landscape. Okay, and now my approximation. So this e tilde is a quadratic function of this uh, step size delta w, right? So you have a linear component and a quadratic component. And so it means it has one globally optimal step size. And we will find this by taking uh, the derivative with respect to my step size and setting it to zero. That's what we, 
what we've been doing so far in any of these optimization problems, right? So we take the drift if and set it to zero, solve it, and that will give us my optimal value. And now we're going to do the same for this uh, approximated uh, error function. So that means, okay, we're going to compute the derivative with respect to delta w. So the derivative with respect to delta w of this term, so not to w, uh, but to my step size. So this is the parameter in this approximation. Um, okay, so we compute the derivative uh, that will give me uh, the gradient itself. Then we take the derivative of this quadratic term. We see delta w over here. So this one drops out and we multiply this with a two. Uh, we've seen this actually uh, before that um, the derivative of such a quadratic function will be uh, two times a half times well, what we had transpose hessian and of course this uh, factor cancels out so let me just remove it okay so this is the derivative with respect to the step size delta w and we set it to zero and this is the, my optimality criterion right so this is what we're going to solve now for my step size uh, delta w okay let's solve this so we move the gradient to the other side and then take the transpose on both sides. So this is minus the gradient transpose. All right, I moved this to the other side and then took the transpose of both sides. And since the Hessian is symmetric, uh, this transpose doesn't do anything. And then we see that we, have find, uh, we find the optimal solution for the step size uh, to be minus Hessian inverse gradient. Okay, now let's do a dimensionality check or uh, let's see what, what we're dealing with here. So in our convention, the gradient is a row vector. Um, so taking the transpose turns this into a vector. So matrix vector multiplication gives me a new vector. So my new update step is again a vector. So that's correct because W is a vector. And now we take uh, a direction in this step. So we have our previous uh, weight uh, vector and we add now this step to it, which is given by minus Hessian inverse uh, times the gradient transpose of my uh, error. Okay, so let me quickly get back to this figure. So we were analyzing, uh, we're making an approximation of my error function around my initial uh, W, uh, that gives me this, for example, this quadratic form over here, which is given by this Taylor uh, expansion, this Taylor approximation. And then we solve basically um, for the minimal value of this error function that gives me the next, uh, that actually gives me a delta w relative to this uh, initial uh, w naught. So we jump in that direction and that gives me the next weight. So that's what you see over here. This is the update rule. Okay, so we see that, um, well, first of all, we do not need to define a step size because we immediately jump to the next um, optimal location uh, given our approximation. So, and what we need to compute then is the gradient. Well, we've done that so far. Um, I'll go over that in a minute. And we have to compute the Hessian. And that's also what I'm going to show next. As for the gradient, we showed that in the previous lecture for, um, if I say my error, if I say that my, uh, let me write it here. If my total error of W is given by the sum over all its components so that's denoted with this en okay this is my error and this is the gradient uh, vector uh, so we took the transpose here of my error of my individual error for this data point so that was just the error that i make for that data point times uh, the vector so for the full uh, gradient it looks like this so the sum over all data points of yn minus tn phi n. So, and we can write this in matrix vector notation as followed, follows. So we have this um, design matrix containing all these uh, feature vectors times my prediction vector. So we're stacking all my predictions in one vector minus uh, the, target, oh, the target vector. Because recall that the data matrix or the design matrix is of size n by m. 
So for each data point, I had a feature vector and I stack them on top of each other. So I have all these rows of data points. And then if I take the transpose, that means I'm summing and multiplying over the nth, uh, over the n axis of the data, the axis. So I'm multiplying all these errors with the corresponding uh, basis functions. And that will give me a vector of length m. Okay, so we compute the gradient in one step via this matrix vector multiplication. Now also the Hessian, we can write it in this matrix uh, vector form um, by computing, by writing out the i and j components of this matrix. Now we already computed uh, the gradient with respect to the j component, That's, that looks like this, this difference vector times the j component of uh, well, the end data point, the end uh, feature vector. So this thing over here is essentially d, d, w, j of my error function. And now I'm computing the i derivative of this thing. And remember, we're computing derivative with respect to w, and the w is hidden in this uh, yn, right? Uh, because each yn, uh, let me write it over here, each yn is given by the logistic sigmoid of my w vector transpose phi n. Okay, so let's compute this, the derivative with respect to w of this thing. This thing doesn't depend on w, so I have to focus on the product of y n times phi j. So that gives me the sum n is 1, the sum remains there, phi j of data point x n. And then the thing that actually depends on w, so the d y n d w i. Okay, so this thing is what I uh, have to compute. And it's also this thing of which we already computed derivative um, previously. So let me write it above. The derivative of this thing is yn times 1 minus yn phi i xn. Okay, so let me insert that. That gives me the sum from n is 1 to n of yn 1 minus yn phi i phi j. Okay, so the i j component of the Hessian is given by this expression. Now let's also write this in matrix vector notation. So that gives me, so let's start off with this. So this was my express, expression for the Hessian. So y n phi n phi n transpose. And I can write it like this because uh, the Hessian is an m by m matrix, where for each i and each j I have m components. So essentially I'm multiplying, uh, making this multiplication for every i, j. And I can do this uh, by taking uh, the, the product of my factor n with its trans transpose. So that's essentially this thing describes this for every i, j. Okay, so this gives me uh, the Hessian matrix. Let me see if I can also reduce this uh, sum over n. Um, so we can do that by working again with this design matrix, uh, transpose some diagonal matrix. Okay, so what is happening here? Each design matrix is again a dimension n by m. So this will be, with the transpose, this will give me a matrix of m by n. So I sum over the n axis also for this case, where since this is going to be now a diagonal matrix for which the Rn so the, the diagonal is given by yn1 minus yn, and the off-diagonal components are set to zero, so meaning if n unequals m. Okay, so now we also have an expression for uh, the Hessian uh, in this matrix uh, notation. Okay, so please verify yourself that this is indeed the case, right? That I can use these uh, design matrices with a diagonal matrix R, which essentially encodes these weights or these uh, components um, of N. Okay, so we have just derived the gradient and the Hessian uh, given the things that were provided to us, right? We have this data set, uh, which we uh, turn, uh, use the basis functions to create new feature vectors for each data point. So that's all encoded in this data matrix. And these are my predictions and these are my targets. And with that, I can compute the gradient and I can also compute the Hessian. Now that we have actually computed the Hessian, we can show that indeed the error function is convex. 
um, where uh, we say that a function is convex whenever its Hessian is positive definite. And positive definite basically means that if I multiply this Hessian on the left and right side with some non-zero w, then it always returns some positive value. So if we can show that this is the case, then we have proven that uh, the, our Hessian is positive definite and indeed across entropy a loss is convex. So let's uh, quickly do that. So we have computed our Hessian as follows, right? Using these design matrices, which were of size n by m. So we have n data points and m uh, feature vectors. And then we have this diagonal matrix, so a sort of weight matrix, which is of size n by n, which for each data point uh, assigns the following weight. So the product of these two uh, probabilities. Okay, so what, what I'm going to show next is that for every uh, w transpose hessian w that this returns some positive value so let me just write this out so it's if w transpose times my design matrix transpose times r times phi times w and what i'm going to do next is make use of the fact that each of these y n's they're either bigger than uh, zero and uh, smaller than one meaning that I can take the square root of these diagonal elements. So actually I can, this allows me to write R as the product of these two uh, square roots where I'm defining the square root of my matrix R as the diagonal matrix um, given by the square root of Yn times one minus Yn. Okay, I can do this, right? So this expression can be rewritten as W transpose my design matrix transpose square root of R square root of R phi W. And what we're actually essentially seeing here is we essentially take the scalar product between two, two vectors. So um, let me make that a little bit more explicit. So we're actually computing the product of this a vector so this is a matrix this is a matrix times a vector it gives me some new vector and I take the transpose of this and I multiply it with itself so that's essentially what is written over here and the scalar product of a vector with itself uh, boils down to taking the norm of this vector squared so what we see is that we can rewrite uh, w transpose hessian w in the following form and well uh, a norm always gives me a positive value um, or it gives me zero when the vector is uh, zero but we're considering all non-zero uh, w's so this proves that for every non-zero w my expression uh, returns some positive number so my hessian is indeed convex so it satisfies this uh, criterion for all non-zero vector w's that's what we've shown over here so indeed my Hessian is positive definite and this means that my error function, my cross entropy loss is indeed convex. Okay, and then we have everything in place to uh, compute this update rule where we have to compute the gradient, which we can do as follows, where we have to compute the Hessian or actually the inverse of the Hessian. Uh, so this is actually a, a, uh, actually a computationally expensive step, but we can do this. And for the Hessian, we make use of this sort of diagonal weight matrix where we weight this inner product between all these um, factors using the weights yn, 1 minus yn. And this followed from, uh, well, um, the computation of the second order uh, derivatives. Okay, and now with this, this in place, we can actually rewrite this update step to a particular form, um, which actually led to the fact that people started calling this the iterative reweighted least squares algorithm. Um, because each update step can actually be formulated as a least squares problem where uh, the new uh, weights are obtained via uh, some equivalent uh, fitting uh, least squares problem. And I'm going to show this at fol as follows. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite this expression into a form uh, that corresponds to the solution to a, a weighted least squares problem. And I'm going to start off by factorizing this thing. So I move this thing up front. Um, okay, let me just write it out. Okay.
Okay, you can see that this is still the same, right? So uh, this Hessian, uh, so this is actually the Hessian inverse. If I now multiply with this, I end up with uh, W tau minus one. And if I multiply with this thing, I obtain this uh, uh, form over here. So I'm just rewriting things now, because especially in the next step, it will start to become clear what I'm doing. So let me also just write that one out. Now, what I did here, I introduced this new uh, var variable, uh, z or z, um, such that I could write it in this form. So it's a, it's a lot of trickery going on here, um, um, but I'm doing this because um, this term over here can then be canceled out because we have this r times r inverse, actually this phi times r times r inverse times this thing. So this entire thing then uh, can be get uh, rid of. And that would give me that this update rule is given in the following form. So this was the Hessian inverse as we saw it, R Z. Okay, and this is what we wanted to see. We have that my new weights uh, at times at tau are given as follows. And just looking at, um, this particular form, it resembles a lot the least squares solution, right? We've, we've seen this before, but then without the R. So if this R wouldn't be, be there, it would be just a least squares solution to some fitting problem. But now we introduce these R's. So these R are, R's are additional weights and we have this Z uh, and that's sort of the thing that we want to predict. So what kind of regression problem would this correspond to? I'm going to write that out over here. So this would actually be the solution to the following minimization problem. So we're looking for the weights W that minimizes a weighted least squares, where we have W transpose phi n minus Zn, where this would be uh, the target in my uh, fitting problem. Uh, and these are like uh, additional weights that sort of weights uh, the importance of, well, the data points that I'm considering. So not to be confused with, with my parameters, uh, W, right? These are just weights used to weigh the error, basically, that you're making. Okay, now that's the reason why people call this the iterative uh, reweighted least squares algorithm, because in every update step, I'm essentially solving a weighted least squares problem uh, where my weights are given by uh, these weights which were also used in the Hessian computation. Basically the product of my probability for class one times the product uh, times the probability for my uh, other class, you know, a one minus uh, the probability for class one. And my targets are given as follows. And to be honest, I cannot give a clear interpretation to this, but the point is in each step we solve this um, uh, weight at least squares problem where at each step we have to update the weights because these weights depend on W on my current solution W and I update my targets. Okay, so the main point of this slide was to show wh where does this iteratively re-rate at least squares uh, name come from. Um, so that this actually means that if we now draw this, so um, green here uh, shows the path obtained via stochastic gradient descent. So if we have curvature in our energy landscape, we sort of take a roundabout route because we just walk downhill uh, without considering like the overall landscape. Whereas in my second order um, optimization scheme, so the newton refson scheme, I actually take the curvature of my error landscape into account and that allows me to come up with a shorter uh, route. And the idea behind this newton refson optimization was um, that we uh, make an approximation of our error function, like a quadratic approximation, solve it for its optimal location and jump to that point. Then again, we make this quadratic uh, approximation and immediately jump to that point where we start off with an, an initial uh, set of weights and the weights at the next time step 
where in each step the new model parameters are obtained via this uh, weighted least squares uh, problem where at each <laughs> time step you solve uh, this um, weighted least squares problem with targets that are updated based on the current set of parameters and also my weights for this uh, weighted least squares are updated based on my uh, current predictions. Okay, now there's some clear advantages of Newton Refson over a stochastic gradient uh, descent. Uh, first of all, we have that there's no need uh, to define a step size. So that's nice, it doesn't depend on, well, this additional hyperparameter, the step size. Um, it also converges faster. Um, so faster convergence than stochastic gradient descent, but it requires uh, the Hessian. But most importantly, we need to compute the inverse of the Hessian. And this is computationally the most expensive step of this uh, update scheme, computing the inverse of the Hessian, because computing the inverse of a matrix often uh, scales uh, cubically with the number of elements in the Hessian, uh, with the number of basis functions that it considers, so it scales with m to the power 3. And there's a lot of research going on on uh, figuring out which kind of matrices can be inverted quickly and also how to make maybe clever approximations to this. Uh, because it is nice that you can obtain your final globally optimal uh, solution with less steps. It's just that these steps are hard to compute and there are smart uh, approximations and alternatives to, to this actually. Okay, so what I described was an alternative for stochastic gradient descent, a second order optimization method. And at this point, I just want to uh, point out that such second order optimization methods do not just apply to uh, the logistic regression case, but uh, it could be applied to, to other type of optimization problems as well.